we're going to go through a case, and we're going to ask you some questions, and you'll use your phone to reply to the, ca uh, to the case. Um, how many nurses we have in the room? Okay. Um, how many uh, EMS? Okay. How many physicians? Okay. All right. So your vote's going to be outvoted anyways. So let's start off, uh, Trauma Red in Tucson. Trauma Red is our highest level of activation. That means that you have a physiological or an anatomical problem. So that's the highest level of activation. It's at midnight, 47-year-old male, uh, fell from uh, some height onto a wash. Wash is something that only people in Arizona know what that is. So GSS-13 and hypotensive, classic standard case. And so on your primary survey, the airway's intact, they're breathing and talking, clearly, uh, bi clear bilaterally. Blood pressure's uh, 110 systolic, is diaphoretic. Uh, Glasgow coma scale is okay, 14, moving all extremities, anxious, and he's combative. Um, distended abdomen, crepitus is noted. And uh, maybe he's got an unstable pelvis, you know, that's a little harder to tell, but he's got a pelvic binder on. Uh, left thigh hematoma, which someone calls out, don't pay much attention to, and his uh, arm is obviously broken. And uh, here's his vitals, 119 over 105, heart rate's 85. Uh, so we get the adjuncts to the primary survey, which includes a chest x-ray, and then uh, we hurry up and get a pelvic film, and that's what you see. Okay. For those uh, who are not that uh, used to seeing the films, something just not right. <laughs> so primary survey. Uh, so what we have a picture on the left is what is hard to tell, but he's got this unusual hematoma in his thigh. And uh, the, the fever feels like it's okay, but he's got this big hematoma in his thigh. He's got a binder on. And that uh, picture on the left is supposed to show a broken humerus, but it looks like it's in fairly good um, position. So first question is, pelvic binder, pro and con. Uh, this is going to be a, um, more of a question for you guys as well, and then I'll just uh, make things up here on stage, I guess. So the question is, uh, A, of course, B, no way. See, what is a pelvic binder? <laughs> D, put it on, but don't tighten it. And E, just go back to the call room. <laughs> okay, so, Clay, uh, okay, so that's what you're supposed to do if you know how to text. So, two people voted, huh? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> How long should I wait? Uh, Five minutes? <laughs> Until someone gets the right answer? <laughs> All right, I got a no way. What I'm is getting, it? Uh, Everybody knows what it is? 27s and 28s. So that's... Put it on, don't tighten it. It's like a girdle that you don't tighten. Only one person wants to go back to the call room? <laughs> okay, no way he's pushing. Okay, so it's a horse race here, it looks like. Uh, so I'll just say that we, we, put, we instituted, you can keep voting, you can keep voting, uh, and I'll keep chatting until uh, uh, we get going here. But uh, we instituted a policy that if you are suspicious to just put on the binder, but you don't have to necessarily tighten all of them. So this, this public binder, as most people probably understand and know, it has to be put on the right way. It's not just a blind thing. We'd like to be positioned over, over your hips and your bones the right way. And that when you have an open book pelvic fracture, which is what's very common when you have a head-on collision if you were on a motorcycle, and it splits your pelvis open, then that volume is, is increased. And we all know that the bones and the veins in the pelvis bleed quite heavily. 
and be, can be quite problematic. So the idea is, well, if it was started small and went big, then reduced to space. So because volume is related to the uh, R to the fourth power, uh, you can reduce the space tremendously. However, it is a known fact that this has never been uh, proven. So it is an unproven thing that we're doing that we think works. So in some cases, such as uh, malgain fracture, which is when you fall off a height and you don't land perfectly on your feet, and you land on one side, sometimes that'll cause what's called a shear injury, and your SI joint will tear. And then that, in that kind of situation, if you put on a binder, it doesn't necessarily help. Also, if you're, because that SI joint is busted in the back, uh, if, if there's no hinge back there and you just try to squeeze things together with a binder, sometimes the orthopedic guys don't like that either. So it's not always uh, a great idea. But if you want to close the space and you think closing the space stops bleeding, then we can do it. But that, again, has never been proven. Okay, so this uh, point that this is a very common fracture. We, are, we have all sorts of uh, policies to do it. And for the nurses as well in the ED, uh, that's one thing is putting it on, but in the ICU it's a major issue because we're always wondering how to take it off because you can't have this thing on for too long because you have a lot of tissue breakdown. Uh, one of the things that we also do is I like to use the pelvic binder for hip fractures. So even if you don't have a pelvic fracture, I like to use it for hip fractures. And there's, again, a lot of debate about this. But I think that when you put it on, somebody who's got a hip fracture, it hurts, but then it stabilizes, okay? So when, you, when you're in the process of putting it on, sometimes they'll, uh, they'll, uh, they'll scream from the pain, but when you're doing transfers from bed to bed and when you're going from bed to scanner and so on like that, since it's a little bit of a support, like a big girdle, it seems to help. So I, I think that uh, that's why I always like to put it on because our, our orthopedic surgeons, and we made a big deal policy about putting it on every pelvic fracture, so we put it on, but I don't necessarily always tighten it, okay? So I like to see at least a film to see if it is, or if a person has it and they're hemodynamically normal, things aren't displaced, then I don't necessarily need to just yank on it and tighten it. So that's why I think the answer would be kind of like A and D, of course, or you can put it on, but you don't necessarily have to tighten it, okay? And, and then uh, you shouldn't go back to your call room. Okay, so uh, this goes through with these thoughts. So the pelvic binder was placed, and we did the ultrasound on the fast, and it was uh, negative for fluid. But uh, the blood pressure falls in your trauma bay now, and, uh, this, but the guy's still talking to you. He is diaphoretic. He is kind of, something's not right. The, you know, the, the, the antenna is up, and you know this guy's not going to do that great. But, uh, but he is talking to you. He's still answering questions. So you don't trust it, and you repeat the fast, and uh, it's still negative. So we stopped the infusion of the crystalloids as Dr. Davis talked about, we start to use the blood. So it's a trauma red for us. We get a cooler in the room right away with every trauma red of uncross matched blood. And when we start saying, when they get hypotensive, our first reaction is to stop the crystalloids and start to hang blood. That's an automatic thing for trauma reds in our institution. So well, we end up giving a couple of units. We did take the time there uh, to put an, a radial A line in and a, and a central line as well. Now the blood pressure's up. Heart rate 75 is in pain. Next steps. What would you do for this person who has a negative fast, hypotensive episode, episode that seems to be transiently responding to your fluids? Do you go to surgery? I heard that he had a pelvic fracture with hypotension, so an angiogram is a possibility. Take him to the CT scanner because the primary survey in trauma is airway breathing and CT scan. And after all, this is America, so we should scan them. <laughs> Diagnostic peritoneal aspirate means that if they have fluid in the belly, you want to see if they got a lot of it, so you just put in the catheter very quickly. How many people here remember what the DPL was? Okay, so this is the same as a DPL, except instead of lavaging with fluids, we're just going to be aspirating, because as a reminder, when you're in hemorrhagic shock and your blood pressure goes down, you're going to be losing 30 to 50 percent of your blood volume, 30 to 40 percent of your blood volume, and technically, that's about a six-pack. 
Okay, that's about the volume in a six pack. So we're not looking for just a little bit of water or fluids. We're looking for a six pack. So if you have a six pack of blood in your belly, if you put a catheter in, you should be able to get a gush back. And then just keep giving them more blood. Okay, so we'll take your votes at this time. Call angio, call CT scan, surgery, go back to the call room, it's always an option. Four, seven, 12, call angio. CT scanner, it's a race, look at that. So cool, go back to the call room. Two of them wanna go back to the call room. <laughs> Couple aspirates here, Mo blood, that's always a good idea. I think the answer is always gonna be Mo blood. Okay, 27, CT scanner, call angel. Some people want to just go to surgery. Some people take a while to text. <laughs> All right, okay. So I would say that the answer is um, surgery is something that uh, you could definitely do and I think you would be justified in doing. Okay, so uh, that's a gestalt that you're going to have, and I would assume that you're going to do surgery for the abdomen, right? I mean, I don't know, not for craniotomy, I hope. Uh, calling angio, I think that's a great thing that you could do. You should call angio every single patient that comes in, just call them and say hello. Uh, <laughs> we might need you, get ready, and then call them back and say fake. Yeah. But at least they'll start in the process. For us, they have a 30-minute response time. That's 30 minutes for the, the tech to be in the room. It obviously will take a lot longer than that. CT scanner, uh, that's the one thing that we always teach. You never take a patient that's unstable to the CT scanner. And I think that is kind of changing, okay? That's been a general dictum for trauma. Never take an unstable patient to the CT scanner. You don't want to code them in the CT scanner. but. If a person's dying and you're doing an ED thoracotomy on him, obviously you wouldn't do, you wouldn't take him to a scanner. But right now, we kind of prop these guys up with just enough blood, and they kind of look stable, and you take a chance and you scan them, right? So because we really want that info, it's gonna change a lot of our therapy sometimes. So that's a little different. But you know that when, if the patient does code in the, in the scanner, then you're gonna, have a hard time justifying that. So I think that for those who answered CT scan, you know, with the patient responding from the blood, I think that would be uh, a decent thing to do as well. DPA, if you wanted to DPA this guy, I would say definitely that's not, you know, this is the, the scenario that you DPA and where you had a transient response, um, pelvic fracture, but you wanna know basically is the liver bleeding, is the spleen bleeding, and a DPA is a great tool. So for those who answered that, I think you're also correct. Uh, and then mo blood, you should always have mo blood, okay. And then you then go then go back to the call room, okay. So the answer to that, I think, uh, optimal answer might have been the CT scanner if you had to choose one, but I'd say all of those uh, have a role. So great. So this is a scanner, and what you see is fluid around the liver. Uh, on the right side, there's a, a little darker area there. The spleen looks okay. <clears throat> Has. Uh, some thickened bowel right there. You can see the outline of the intestines a little bit more, which shouldn't be there. And a little maybe some mesenteric thickening. And he has free fluid somewhere down in the pelvis. But the pelvis is also very important down there because you see how shattered it is as he landed on that pelvis. And it wasn't a uh, one where it was an open book fracture or a malagain, but he probably just fell on that hip or on that leg. So that's what that CT scan shows. And he's got this... Last picture here is a thigh hematoma. And in the left thigh, which is on, on your right, you see in that muscle there that you see a little white contrast. Do you see that bright thing that's there? And that's probably a vessel that's extravasating, which means it's actively bleeding at this time period. So that would explain for that hematoma. And you can see that that thigh is bigger than the other thigh. Okay. And then the pelvic films that uh, on bony cuts, we recreate that and uh, we'll see that the acetabulum is just shattered on the, on the left side. And so we activated at this time the massive transfusion protocol 
which starts to thaw his blood and bring us his type specific, both red cells and also FFP and then platelets as well. Now, after the CT scanner, he comes back to the trauma bay. His blood pressure is 98, heart rate is 75, and uh, he got four units of packed blood in the CT scanner. Next step, surgery, angio, CT scanner, go back. DPA, mo blood, go back to call room. That's always last answer. Okay, because I don't remember this slides in here, so. Um, okay, so we went to the operating room, so the question is, why you go no OR, no angio? Uh, so, so what we're expecting, what the question here is, uh, with that blood around the liver, we know that there's fluid in the belly, and with that bad pelvic fracture, you can guess and probably guess correctly that he's bleeding in the pelvis. So the question is, which one's a higher priority? Which one would we do next? So I'll tell you our, our thinking at this time period. Uh, what we found here, what you see a picture of is that organ in the top is his liver, okay? That's probably what my liver looks like. It's called cirrhosis. Uh, the mesentery had some bleeding in it. The bowels were okay and had a big hematoma in the pelvis because of the pelvic fracture. So uh, we went to the operating room first because of what Chad Ball, is Chad still here? He's going back to his room. Okay, so, oh, he's still here, good man. Uh, what he talked about was, he talked about this, what it was, a, the hybrid room, right? The hybrid room. So I heard about this hybrid room a couple of years from Chad, so I went back to my administrators and cried and whined until I got my own. Uh, and so we got a $3 million hybrid room in Tucson, Arizona, but I'm not allowed to use it. Uh, so the problem with that is that the vascular surgeons now run it. It's their room. I help them get it. It looks pretty nice. And the thing is, uh, we have to wait for Angel, and I can't risk him having a simple thing like a spleen or a liver that we can fix. So it, while I'm waiting for them, I'm going to go take a quick look, open up the abdomen, and put some stitches and stuff that bleeds. So he had a liver bleeder that we sewed up. Um, so we went to OR room one instead of the hybrid room. Uh, three liters of hemoperitoneum and ascites. So a lot of that fluid was, uh, was not blood, it was actually ascites from the cirrhosis. But you don't know at that time period and you don't want to take risks for the patient's lives, so you want to get, take care of some things uh, for a definitive, in a definitive manner while you're waiting for other, cap uh, other capabilities. So uh, spleen was not injured. Now he got a lot of blood at this time period. As you can see, 15 units of PAC cells, 13 of FFP. So we're trying to catch up here and try to do that damage control resuscitation. We actually use also 5% hypertonic saline in the beginning aspect. And we use three liters of the horrible crystalloids. So at this stage, <clears throat> uh, angel room is five minutes out and hybrid room is being cleaned. And that's the reason why we did this. So what would you do here intraoperatively? Would you have me pack the pelvis, pack the liver and spleen and pelvis, ligate, clip, internal, bilateral, internal iliacs, close the fascia? Do I take him to vascular surgery for the hybrid room or to radiology for the IR? Where do I go? I'm confused. Where's my call room? And should I put in an A-line? Okay, so let me uh, go through quickly. I would, uh, packing the pelvis, I don't like to do. That's a big trend right now that everybody likes to do preperitoneal packing, but I think that blood is the best hemostatic agent. So to take out that natural hemostatic agent that's in the, all that tissue and replace it with sponges, I don't think I actually get more tamponade there. So that's a big thing that we're doing the last 10 years is a lot of trauma centers are packing the pelvis in the, the preperitoneal space. So that's what I personally think about packing the pelvis. Packing the liver, and the, uh, uh, I don't like to pack the belly too often. And if I pack, I always make sure the pack is absolutely necessary. A lot of times people will just pack and leave it. I will always try to see if it stops the bleeding and then I pull it out to see if it makes it worse. Uh, so I can actually just worry about the bleeding itself rather than just covering it up. Ligating it and clipping the bilateral internal iliacs. When I go to angiogram, uh, that's what I'm going to do anyways. 
I'm going to go after the vessels that come off the internal iliacs, which provide blood to the pelvis, and I'm going to have the radiologist uh, embolize those vessels anyways. So even if it's not an arterial bleeder, we go after those vessels because we think that stopping the arterial hemorrhage in that area will stop the venous hemorrhage and will make the patient not die, which is always better than dying. And uh, we found that the, that the bilateral non-selective angiography and, and, and embolization actually doesn't have that high of a complication rate in comparison to the people who get these types of fractures. The impotence rate was up to 40% whether you got your internal iliacs clipped, ligated, thrombosed, or not done. So uh, just something to keep in mind if you're on that motorcycle, okay, you want to practice your pelvis, you know, the bad part is if you live and you, then you're impotent for the rest of your life. So we also like to close the fascia because we like to get some tamponade into that space. And I'm going to choose between vascular and radiology depending on who gets there first. And I always put in the femoral A-line so that when the angiographer gets here, that's five minutes that they didn't waste. So they already got a line in place and they can just switch it out with a wire and get going. Uh, so this is what the patient looked like afterwards. That hematoma in the thigh is bigger, which is kind of odd. I've never seen that before. And uh, this is, we ended up going to the hybrid room. And this is our hybrid room as well. And they're doing the angiogram. And as Chad showed you on his, this is a very large room. It's got a lot of fancy gear. And they're doing all this sterily with big screen TVs. And One day I hope that they'll let me use that room. Okay, so we talked to a vascular surgeon, and our vascular surgeons actually do the uh, embolization of the pelvic fractures. Okay, so I know that that's probably not uh, something that's ubiquitous in all the other hospitals, but uh, most of our vascular surgeons have the knowledge and capability of doing that. Some of the senior vascular surgeons don't like to do that because they don't have that uh, capability. And uh, what they did was they selectively coiled and uh, put in gel foam, got a lot more... Um, transfusions, but what they also did was they embolized the bleeding artery in the left thigh, okay? They found an active bleeder that they embolized. But uh, when we took the patient to the recovery room later on, his ascites and this, you know, hypotension and all the blood transfusions, he ended up resulting in actual abdominal compartment syndrome, which is not very common nowadays since we'd stopped using all the crystalloids. But in his uh, case, he is, his bladder pressure went up, our trauma fellow called, and uh, she took him back and put uh, a packing on and, uh, and relieved his intra-abdominal pressure. So, okay, abdomen's tense, so this is going to go actually a little quickly, meaning that, uh, so I, I think I already gave you the uh, answer to this one. We took the patient to the operating room, so we'll, we'll, we'll uh, forego the texting on this one and we're kind of running on time. So let's go back to the slides. And so well, we went back to the operating room and you could do that anywhere, but uh, we put a vac on. So uh, and when we went back in there, there's a lot of fluid in there because the patient had ascites. So some of this is gonna be blood and some of it is going to be actual ascites. And so it looks like a mess as you would imagine the next morning. Um, hour five through eight, uh, we called ortho, ongoing bleeding, more transfusions, 51 units of blood, hypotensive, and as soon as my fellow stopped giving blood, he starts to drop his pressure. You know, as soon as the bag runs out, it drops his pressure. So what do you do in the morning? And now it's the next day, sun's come up, and the patient's requiring a lot of blood. You've been in the belly, you already did the embolization in the pelvis, so what's going on and what's next? Do you go to the operating room, angiogram, ICU, back to the colon? Okay, with that, we voting on this one, Clay? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> no one's voting. This, uh, I got a couple of people that always want to go back to the call room, all right? 
Yeah, okay, so operating room angel. So what we did in this situation was we we're fairly sure about what, what was bleeding. And so we ended up taking the patient back to the angiogram. And even though we did the angiogram, a lot of times these vessels will uh, open up uh, later on and you need to do another angiogram. So that's something that you need to keep in mind. We'll also keep that sheath in the patient in case you need to have this scenario and situation. So they found a bleeder in the pelvis and uh, they embolized that as well. And they actually went to the other side to see if anything else is going on. So then, uh, to make a long story short, we don't wait too long. This is a third laparotomy, so he said two angiograms, and now a third case where we take the patient back, take all the stuff out that we left behind, left, if you left your packing in there or your car keys, whatever you did, you take it out and close the abdomen so it's nice and tight. And the patient uh, uh, did poorly over the time period and then eventually ended up dying. And uh, the, uh, the reason for these patients that usually die is that if when they get that type of a massive uh, um, resuscitation, the liver doesn't do so well. So let me give you another quick thing. I'll spend one minute on this, which is, I uh, won't show you the video that comes with this, but if in the operating room, if the blood pressure fell to about systolic of 50, what would you do? Would you A, open the left chest and cross clamp the aorta, B, cross clamp the aorta under the diaphragm, um, C, cross clamp it under the renal arteries, clip the internal iliacs, or do this Reboa thing? I'd like to see what the audience thinks here at this point. We had a, a mention about what this Reboa was, and I think we've got to talk about it tomorrow as well. All right, we got uh, some people that want to open up the chest, clamp the aorta. Oh, we got 11 people that want to do the Reboa. I would say that <clears throat> optimally what I would do five years ago is I would probably cross clamp the um, uh, the aorta is a possibility. If I did it, I would do it in the belly. For people who aren't familiar with getting control of the aorta in the abdomen that easily, because it's not that easy to do, opening the chest is a viable option. Uh, for me, I like to just go into the preperitoneal space and clip the internal iliacs, because that's the ultimate bleed source of hemorrhage. If I think it's bleeding from the pelvis, I'll do the internal iliacs. But nowadays, we have this thing called Reboa, and so that's when you put in a balloon into the aorta, and stop the blood to, from going down to the pelvis and exsanguinating, and you do that through the groin, especially if they already did an angiogram, right? So uh, steps of Reboa, which we'll go over tomorrow, so I'm not gonna say it too much, but for, when I teach Reboa, the things that you have to know, and this terminology is, is actually that, uh, uh, it's not that difficult, but when you do the wires, you know, with the A lines and femoral lines and so on, the wires basically come in two sizes, 0.17 and 0.35. And basically, you need to get into the artery and put a, a small wire in, and then you need to put a small sheath in. The small sheath is a five French, and you actually have to know these numbers. The five French, you can do just about any type of angiogram that you need to do, including an aortogram. And then, so once you get into the artery, you just switch it out for a stiff wire, which, which you call an Amplat stiff wire, and then you put in a really big sheath so you can put the coat of balloon in. And so you have to have a kit, you have to make your kit and have it ready. We have it in a big Tupperware container and that's what it looks like. This is a case that we did about a month ago. Dr. Joseph, one of my partners, uh, put in a balloon catheter in this patient who was uh, continually dying in the operating room and then we were able to take the patient back and uh, fix him later on. So I'll stop here. It's time for our break uh, and, uh, and uh, don't forget to uh, see the vendors. Thank you.